thank you all for having me, and Paul, thank you for that overly kind introduction. Um, I am always happy to be in Jackson. Uh, we do not have a Persephone bakery in Laramie. <laughs> Um, I moved to Wyoming in 2009, and uh, prior to that date, I knew one person from the state of Wyoming. Uh, her name is Michelle Sullivan, and as you all know, she ran the Snake River Institute uh, here in Jackson, and which I think is, you know, broadly speaking, uh, similar to uh, Saturday U and the work of uh, the humanities councils and institutes in the state. Um, uh, I met Michelle in uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, she invited me and my wife, Issa, to uh, consider moving out here to Wyoming. It was the uh, best choice we ever made, and um, so it is uh, only appropriate that I am speaking in a uh, forum that uh, honors that tradition. Uh, I want to talk today about a politically contentious and often divisive topic, which is immigration law. Uh, I feel like I drew the short straw for speaking at 9 a.m. Um, in a beautiful place on a Saturday morning in ski season on a trip when I can't go skiing. Um, <laughs> enough of my needs, all right. Um, uh, after I uh, conclude my remarks, we'll have time for discussion, and then we will ramp up to auditory and visual uh, uh, delights offered by my colleagues. So this is the part of the program where you are, are supposed to be agitated and concerned about our dysfunctional immigration system. Uh, like all good lawyers, I would like to start with uh, what is not controversial, that is, uh, the undisputed facts of uh, our current immigration mess. And uh, with your permission, I will uh, describe a few things uh, on the road to my uh, main presentation, uh, which is going to address three ideas. Uh, uh, first, I want to talk about uh, deferred Action for Parents of Americans, which is uh, President Obama's current uh, executive order, and it has been stalled by a federal judge in Texas, and uh, uh, we can talk about the merits or demerits of that. Uh, next, I want to talk about what a limited and doable immigration law or reform would look like. And finally, I want to talk about uh, the issue of refugees and asylum seekers, particularly as it relates to Wyoming. So with that brief introduction, let me dig in first here to uh, what is not in dispute. I want to suggest that uh, across the political spectrum, we would enjoy broad agreement for the following propositions. One, our current system is broken. How do we know that? because there are approximately 11 million undocumented people in this country, and yet businesses have difficulty attracting the employees they want, and Congress is paralyzed to do anything about it. It's not, Congress is paralyzed on lots of issues, but immigration it is particularly vexing for Congress. And it turns out uh, it is partly a function of our perpetual fundraising and election cycles, so that uh, you are either in an election cycle or you are in a primary cycle uh, for most politicians, and that makes it very difficult to uh, uh, think commonsensically about immigration reform. Uh, second proposition, except for Native Americans, everyone in this country is an immigrant. Right? And I tell my immigration law students that if you don't know where you're from, that is probably an example of white privilege. Right? Um, third, immigration has been a political football for at least a decade. But before that, uh, it was actually the site of some interesting policy experiments. And Wyoming has a proud history of this. Uh, in 1986, then Senator Simpson 
uh, sponsored the Simpson-Mazzoli Act, which um, sought to transform our immigration landscape at the federal level. And I think it, uh, it pays to think why Alan Simpson and why at that moment. And I think one thing is that he did not face particularly aggressive primary challenges. So it was a safe seat, right? And he was committed to working across the aisle. Um, something else that I think uh, was true in 1986 and is true in 2015 is that <clears throat> the conversation about immigration is a little less charged in Wyoming than it is in other places. And I say that because uh, immigration here uh, is a discussion that takes place in an environment, um, first of all, where we don't have a whole lot of people here, right? Um, we have the least populous state in the country. Secondly, um, we have low unemployment and a low percentage of organized labor that sometimes acts to uh, deter competition from uh, legal and illegal immigrants. And third, we're not a border state. So when you hear commentators on TV saying things like, our schools and hospitals are overrun with illegals, uh, which I find as a term to be uh, more than a little dehumanizing, right? Um, the, that is A, wrong factually. Um, and B, a talking point from uh, another part of the country. I would be giving a very different presentation if I was standing in Tucson today. And I have great sympathy for uh, border patrol, for uh, faith-based groups that are out there in the desert trying to help uh, uh, bring water to suffering people. I have sympathy for hospital administrators who uh, cannot balance their books um, or uh, plan for uh, the number of emergency room visits they get by uh, people in dire straits. And I have tremendous sympathy for um, uh, school systems and principals uh, who really do not know in August how many kids they're going to enroll that year. Right? Um, and uh, I would not use the term illegals to describe um, uh, human beings in uh, search of an education that is constitutionally protected according to Plyler versus Doe, but um, I think uh, we should all appreciate that the conversation in Arizona looks very different than the conversation in Wyoming. And I think that gives us a, a point of uh, hope and opportunity. Um, I, my sense is that we could come up with sensible compromise solutions in Wyoming that may not be available in other places, um, regardless of whether they are historically red or blue states. Okay. Uh, let me move forward here to describe the current landscape in Wyoming. And um, I'm using a PowerPoint presentation uh, that my colleague Susie Pritchett developed for a conference uh, with uh, Senator Simpson uh, in September that was held at the University of Wyoming. And uh, some of the details I'm going to share are a little bit outdated. But uh, again, with your permission, um, I will try to bring some uh, more recent information to the conversation and then we can talk about uh, uh, what this data means, particularly for Teton County uh, in the Q&A. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, first I'm going to look at the overall landscape in Wyoming. Second, we're going to talk about the very politically contentious topic of illegal immigration. Then we're going to move to what I believe is an easier discussion of legal immigration concerns and finally conclude with a, uh, a talk about refugee resettlement. Now, who are the immigrants of Wyoming? Wyoming was home to only 18,390 individuals born outside of the United States in 2011. But 
That statistic is highly misleading. Uh, it's not only outdated, but it suggests that lots of folks who work, say, in uh, Jackson, but are resident in uh, Idaho, um, are not captured by, uh, by the number. And uh, equally important, it is hard for census takers to count uh, an undocumented population. So my sense is that that number uh, accurately captures the uh, University of Wyoming professors who were born outside of the country, and it does not accurately <laughs> capture um, uh, 20 to 30 percent of Teton County. Right. Right. In the world of immigration uh, studies and immigration law, we talk uh, about immigrants and non-immigrants. Uh, these terms matter here. So let me talk a little bit about who an immigrant is. Uh, this is partly a subjective test. It has to do with the intent of the person traveling from one country to another. Uh, Non-citizens who intend to make the United States their permanent home are considered immigrants. Uh, people can lawfully immigrate to the country uh, and often they line up for years in uh, foreign states attempting to navigate our Byzantine structure to come to the country uh, as legal immigrants. Uh, immigration has always been highly politicized, and to this day it is characterized by, if not strict quotas, by a numbers-based system that shapes and privileges certain legal immigrants to the country. Um, my family came from Russia, surprise, surprise, with a name like Novogrodsky, um, through Ellis Island in 1905. Uh, my great-grandfather spoke 11 languages, and English was one of them, and he spelled Novogrodsky carefully for uh, uh, the immigration officer. Um, my uh, grandfather uh, shared with me the manifest of the ship that uh, our family took from uh, Antwerp. Um, they traveled overland from Russia to Antwerp and then uh, from there to Ellis Island. Um, what did it mean for uh, uh, Russian Jews with white skin to emigrate to Ellis Island? Uh, not a lot. At the moment uh, they arrived, uh, they needed to demonstrate that they were not uh, carrying an infectious disease, and if you were literate and could write your name, uh, you could satisfy that burden. Not so if you were from, say, China, right, where we had uh, specific laws excluding Chinese people from bringing their family and others. Um, my great-grandfather uh, um, had a brother who uh, could not spell Novogrodsky in English for the, uh, um, for the immigration officer, or whatever the, uh, the control was at Ellis Island. And so we have a branch of the family that are Newton. Uh, Newtown is Novgorod, and um, they sound perfectly British. Um, uh, uh, Fran told the story last night, and my great-grandfather, they didn't sound British when they first got the name Newton, but uh, four or five generations later, they sound like Downton Abbey, right? <laughs> and I don't know exactly how quickly people became U.S. citizens in 1905, but uh, if you had certain attributes or characteristics, uh, you passed through this uh, temporary status of lawful permanent resident, or what today we would call a green card holder, and then you were on your way to U.S. citizenship. Of course, there were other problems. For example, if you were a woman, you couldn't vote, and so what was the value of U.S. citizenship anyway in 1905? But um, uh, today, 
We invite people to legally emigrate to the country. Many come through business uh, and employer-sponsored arrangements or family uh, unification purposes. And uh, we also have categories of uh, lawful resettled refugees and individual asylum seekers. And together, that constitutes the universe of uh, non-citizens who intend to make the United States their permanent home. Uh, that is what we call immigrants. Um, and then we also have a category of people we call non-immigrants. Right? And non-immigrants are uh, people who uh, come across the border illegally and without inspection, uh, usually from Mexico or Central America looking for work. But they are also students, tourists, business visitors, exchange visitors, temporary workers, uh, Canadian hockey team. Um, you can think of uh, many, many people. You, you're <coughs> Let me put it differently. Your au pair from Sweden in Jackson, the day her visa expires, is in the exact same legal situation as somebody who has waded across the Rio Grande and entered the country without status. Let me say that again. So if you are here and your temporary visa has expired, you are in the country illegally. You are removable or deportable. And in the same way, if you enter the country without inspection, you are removable or deportable. Um, there is a difference is that the only difference is that the person who has overstayed their visa had status at one point, and the person who uh, came illegally or on false papers or uh, without inspection uh, never had the status, right? But technically, at least in the minds of uh, uh, lawyers, the, IR, <coughs> the, the INS, or now the Department of Homeland Security, uh, these two populations are identical. Okay. Much has been written and said about undocumented non-citizens. Um, and I use those terms advisedly. Uh, they may have both immigrant and non-immigrant intent but they have entered the country without being inspected or they have overstayed their permission to be in the country. In either event, they are uh, uh, at this moment illegal. Right? Um, we all know what is conjured up by the, uh, the, the term illegals, right? or even illegal immigrants as the New York Times uses it. Um, but it is generally not your business uh, men from England or France who uh, had to stay beyond 90 days and is now uh, conducting work out of a hotel room in San Francisco. Right? In 2011, only 3.6% of Wyoming's official workforce was uh, constituted by non-immigrants sorry, uh, <coughs> by foreigners or foreign-born people who would be either immigrants or non-immigrants. But my sense is that the undocumented immigrant population is undercounted in that statistic. In 2011-2012 year, we had 1,072 foreign students, most of them studying at the University of Wyoming. Undocumented non-citizens comprised less than 1.5% of Wyoming's population in 2010. I suspect that that number is a little low, but um, uh, that's what we've been given by the Immigration Policy Center. The numbers in Florida, California, Texas, Arizona um, range between 10 and 20% of the total population magnitudes difference. We have a growing immigrant population in Wyoming. Between 2000 and 2011, the official population grew by 33%. I would be surprised if the population had not grown by at least 100% in Teton County between 2000 and 2015. Right? And I think uh, anecdotally, we might suspect that that is actually much more than 100%. 
uh, a word about the immigrant population. So to Wyoming, we have uh, uh, a diverse group of immigrants, but um, many, many of uh, the immigrants in Teton County, in, uh, in Southeast Wyoming, and elsewhere are from single communities in Mexico. Right? And, uh, and this has helped the immigrant communities to do well in a, uh, a new place, particularly if uh, some members of the extended family don't speak English. And uh, the reality is that the legal status of the immigrant population to Wyoming varies greatly even within families. And so uh, uh, particularly here in, uh, uh, in this corner of the state and in Idaho, um, many, many families um, have both uh, citizen, U.S. citizen members of the family, lawful permanent residents, and undocumented immigrants, all in one family. Right? Particularly in the energy sector, we have uh, needs for uh, high-tech immigrant labor, uh, highly skilled and highly educated immigrant labor, um, petroleum engineering and other fields require graduates of what we call the uh, STEM sector, science, technology, engineering, and math. And uh, the majority of foreign student, graduate students at the University of Wyoming uh, are in those fields. So to be maybe a little politically incorrect about this, we need uh, a great variety of employees and workers in this state, from highly skilled to uh, less highly skilled um, or more or differently skilled uh, people for different needs. And we also need them for different time frames, right? So um, uh, when you still had a full ski season here, um, uh, uh, Jackson employed lots of foreign ski instructors for part of the year. That would be a classic example of uh, sort of temporary workers. Right. Now, um, I want to talk about one sliver of the conversation about illegal immigrants. Uh, we could talk all day, and uh, we will into lunch, about the, uh, the many aspects of uh, illegal immigration in the country. But um, there is one that has been in the news and is awfully timely, and it is uh, the question of deferred action for parents. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, President Obama's plan uh, a couple of years ago to use executive action not congressional authority. So uh, the power that resides in the executive to uh, try to assist the so-called dreamers. The DREAM uh, Act was a, a bill that, uh, just like uh, <coughs> Schoolhouse Rock, went up to Capitol Hill and uh, remained a bill and did not become a law. Right? So uh, the DREAM Act died, but the DREAMers did not. So who are the DREAMers? Uh, DREAMers are uh, children who were brought to this country um, illegally by non-citizen parents and raised in the United States. Uh, because of uh, uh, what has traditionally been, at least legally, a welcoming environment, um, most of these children were educated in English in our public schools. Uh, many of them graduated um, uh, from our high schools and were kind of alarmed to learn that they're not like every other high school graduate, right? Uh, in that they could have been uh, picked up and deported to their country of origin at any given moment. Um, the Dreamers organized they were uh, illegal students for the most part, or they are illegal uh, uh, status students, 
and they pressed for an act that would regularize their, their contributions. Um, they want to be able to have driver's licenses. They want to have a social security number. Uh, they want to be able to go to university on in-state tuition. They want to be able to join the military and fight for our country. Many of them do not speak the language of their parents. This is less true for the Hispanic community, but totally true for, say, Cambodian and Laotian and uh, uh, Southeast Asian families um, who, say, came to California with a two-year-old uh, who was raised um, in this country and was astounded to learn the first time they were picked up for a misdemeanor offense that they could be <coughs> deported back to a country they had no memory of, right? Um, I was in Cambodia in January and met with a couple of uh, Cambodian Americans who were sent back to Cambodia without their parents, right, and uh, as teenagers, and uh, they don't speak Khmer. So they're part of this like strange, uh, uh, neither here nor there community. Um, many of them are working at like internet cafes and bars to American backpackers and expats because they relate better to uh, us than to their country of origin, if that makes any sense. And they're taking Khmer language classes so that they can try to communicate with, the, uh, with their state of citizenship. Uh, we can debate the reasons or, uh, for either passing or not passing the DREAM Act, but suffice to say that President Obama brought roughly four to five million U.S. raised but not born children out of the shadows with the uh, what's called deferred action uh, or DACA. And uh, this has had tremendous positive and salutary effects in Wyoming. Uh, so your valedictorian, several years running, um, qualifies for DACA relief here from Jackson. Right? And uh, uh, this means that uh, those students get a two-year reprieve from uh, the fear of deportation. They cannot have committed a, uh, a serious crime, a felony offense. And um, with that uh, reprieve, which they have to pay for, it's $495, I think, um, for, to apply for that status, uh, they can then get a driver's license now and uh, um, uh, begin to live a more normal life, right? And, uh, and I think get a social security number for the purposes of moving out of the illegal into the uh, above board economy. Um, for some people in this debate, the fact that uh, this community of people are here illegally ends the discussion, right? So this is a law enforcement matter and their very presence in the country is, uh, is a violation of our federal laws. Um, that is technically true, but we have a roundabout debate in immigration law circles about whether merely being here is illegal. So it is not disputed that crossing over the border without inspection is illegal, but what do you do if that happened 18 years ago and you went to school here and you are raised here? Is your very presence, your living and breathing identity illegal? Um, and for some people, the, the argument is that we uh, erode our lawful immigration system if we allow people to jump the queue and, uh, and come to the country illegally and remain here. And then we, if we reward them with uh, lawful status, we are, uh, <coughs> um, we are perpetuating a cycle of uh, of bad behavior. Uh, and I think I understand that um, on one level, but on another level, it is wholly unrealistic. 
I mean, what are you going to do with uh, 11 to 14 million people in the country? So part of President Obama's uh, idea was when the DREAM Act failed, that he would act unilaterally using his uh, Article I powers under the Constitution to decide we are not going to deport or even threaten that community, and instead we will give them this temporary status. Um, who's in favor of the temporary status? The military, among other entities, right? Um, our, uh, uh, our colleges and universities are uh, wildly enthusiastic about this. Um, and uh, many businesses, particularly in small towns and rural areas, because this is the community of people who are interested in remaining in, the, in those towns and are not going to uh, flee for, for bigger cities. Now, um, more recently, I don't know quite how this happened, but President Obama and the Democrats were trounced in the last elections and then somehow he was re-energized and now he has all these progressive policies that he's uh, trying to implement without uh, the votes in Congress to do it. And so one of these plans is uh, deferred action for parents. So who are the parents? Well, the parents uh, are uh, individuals who came to this country illegally and who knew they were illegal, unlike their children, right? Um, so if we have a purely subjective test, there is more responsibility or culpability associated with this population than with their children. But many of them have US citizen children, right? And uh, so any child born in the United States, on the territory of the United States, according to the 14th Amendment, is a US citizen. Uh, notwithstanding some of the commentators on Fox News, um, this is a legal reality, right? Um, so you're in the country illegally and you have a baby here and now your child is a US citizen, right? Um, what do we do with the parents? Right? Uh, in case after case, the parents are uh, subject to a removal. Um, when that happens and they have small dependent children, we de effectively deport US citizens to another country. Everybody see that? Right. Um, so this program is designed to assist the parents of children who are, uh, who are US citizens and who are being erased according to the American dream. Right. Um, and the idea was if the parents had no criminal record, and pose no threat, that we would uh, somehow uh, provide them with a similar visa, bring them out of the economic shadows, and uh, allow them to stay in the country. Well, <clears throat> opponents of this regime howled at this idea because um, of the concept of anchor babies. Uh, anybody know what an anchor baby is? Yeah, um, yeah, it's really early and I haven't had enough espresso. So, um, uh, an anchor baby, well, it's, it's, a, it's a mythical creature, right? Um, or, or a human being. But um, uh, an anchor baby, as a, as a pejorative term, refers to somebody born in this country in order to allow uh, a broader community to bootstrap on that um, on that person's presence, right? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know much about uh, why some families choose to have children, but uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, this is not the phenomena of birth tourism, right? This is not uh, wealthy South Koreans or Saudi Arabians <laughs> coming to this country in order to have uh, children who will then have US citizenship and be eligible uh, for all the benefits and rights and responsibilities that flow. The idea of the anchor baby is somebody who is somehow uh, strategically born in this country to people who don't belong, right? Um, and uh, uh, that may be an accurate description of some people, but I think we all know uh, 
uh, commonsensically that most um, families that choose to come here come for largely economic reasons. Sometimes they have children here, um, but uh, they and the children usually have an intent to remain, and the children have a status that the parents don't. Right? Uh, so President Obama's uh, second big executive order on immigration would have covered uh, uh, parents. A federal judge in Brownsville, Texas, um, stopped the uh, rollout of the DAPA program with the stroke of a pen a couple of weeks ago. Um, the arguments uh, are not crazy that uh, our constitutional structure around immigration um, suggests that the power should reside with Congress, not with the president, to uh, make laws relating to uh, nationality and citizenship. Right? Um, and so there is a good faith procedural dispute about whether President Obama has exceeded his authority. Um, but substantively, there is very little debate about the benefits of bringing this community uh, into um, the economic and social fold. Right? So um, I will grant the critics that uh, uh, there are some non-trivial concerns with how this is being done. But if it was done, uh, we should all acknowledge that it would create millions of legal taxpayers. Um, it would simultaneously uh, improve the economy and solve our social security crisis. A social security crisis, according to 99% of economists, would disappear if we regularized the 11 to 14 million uh, undocumented immigrants. Here's the problem. Undocumented immigrants are operating uh, generally in two ways. In the sort of 7-Eleven parking lot economy where they are being uh, picked up for day labor or paid in cash as domestic workers in people's houses. Um, and that is a sort of catch as catch can economy, right? Um, but when you pay cash to somebody who is undocumented, you are maximizing their returns um, on, the, on the money, but the government sees none of it, right? And the other way they do it um, is through uh, somebody else's or a false social security number, right? And that means that they're paying into social security but not taking out of it, so that is, uh, a short-term windfall for Social Security, but it creates uh, a lot of exploitation and underemployment. Um, and so we, if we were to regularize the status of this community, and we're talking about uh, five or six million parents who would benefit from this status, we would uh, uh, see immediate economic benefits. We would also decrease the practice, the really horrifying practice, of separating families. Right? And this is the main concern of faith-based groups that have worked tirelessly to stop uh, widespread deportations. Um, you won't hear this much on Fox News, but uh, on the left, people refer to President Obama as the deporter-in-chief. So he has deported uh, more than twice as many people on an annual basis as uh, President Bush did. And um, uh, why is he doing this, you might ask. Um, uh, for many advocates and allies of the uh, uh, undocumented immigrant community, uh, that is a good question. Right? I think he is trying to show that he is uh, strong on, uh, on deportations in order to get changes to the, um, to the Immigration and Nationality Act passed. Um, and I think he was sort of hopeful that he could demonstrate that he was being tough on illegal immigration for a period, um, and now I believe he's just given up on ever getting any uh, comprehensive immigration reform passed. So now he's freestyling, 
right? And um, uh, using the power that he has uh, to tell the Department of Homeland Security how to exercise its prosecutorial and removal discretion, right? So uh, <coughs> Sheriff Joe in uh, Maricopa County is a zealous proponent of arresting and deporting everybody he can find who is in the country illegally, right? And there was a great daily show on deporting Dora back to uh, Mexico. Um, but uh, uh, Sheriff Joe is not a federal official, and so uh, President Obama has given very clear instructions that we should give priority to deporting uh, people with criminal records or um, who pose a threat to the safety of the community rather than uh, all populations who are here illegally. Right? Um, and uh, uh, one of the arguments for this is that this program of deporting uh, four to 500,000 people a year is really expensive. It costs tens of billions of dollars to uh, to interdict and to uh, go out and find and ultimately to remove and then to provide people with some level of due process where they can contest the appropriateness of their deportation. Um, and that is uh, an expensive and cumbersome system to administer. Right. So deferred action for parents, I submit, would be economically beneficial and uh, it would be an extension of uh, executive authority, and um, presumably it could be undone by the next president, right? Because it is uh, uh, an executive uh, action. Um, it is not a, a congressional law that would need to be repealed or, uh, um, or replaced. Uh, this may or may not hold some appeal for Republicans because, um, you know, if they take the White House in 2016, they could have uh, another approach to, uh, uh, to deferred action on both the Dreamers and their parents, right? But, and here's a huge but, everybody knows that's not gonna happen. So support for the DREAM Act is now off the charts. It's at between 80 and 90%. So um, it, is, uh, it is creating a program that I think um, uh, has established facts on the ground that will be much more difficult to unwind, uh, particularly if uh, the new citizen voters, um, Spanish speakers largely, um, uh, are, are voting on that basis. Because we are stuck on the question of what to do with illegal immigration, we are also stuck on the question of what to do with legal immigration. And the legal immigration conversation um, shouldn't be that difficult. For example, when we educate a Chinese math graduate student at the University of Wyoming, um, we provide that student with some financial assistance, uh, less than they would get if they were a uh, Wyoming resident, um, and they are often working uh, towards a degree that is highly applicable in the uh, STEM uh, uh, what do we call it? disciplines, right? Um, here's an idea that uh, Tom Friedman circulated. Why don't we, when we give him a diploma, why don't we give each of our uh, STEM graduates a visa so that they can remain in this country and uh, work in the uh, sectors of the economy that we have just educated them partly at taxpayer expense to contribute to? Right? Um, uh, that seems sort of like a no-brainer, right? Uh, we don't do that. Um, instead, we make them uh, compete through employers or uh, through family unification programs for a scarce number of uh, legal visas through which they can remain and contribute and innovate and be entrepreneurs and invest uh, in this country. We could use a simplified and updated system for both highly skilled and 
uh, less skilled workers, from avocado pickers to nurses to slaughterhouse employees to au pairs and everyone in between. Uh, I spoke to uh, uh, a number of people in Jackson uh, at this September conference, including the manager of the Wirt Hotel, and um, it is hard for HR departments of businesses to comply with our existing laws, right? Um, it takes a lot of money, time, and expertise to comply with a system to get uh, somebody into uh, a certain visa category, um, particularly when there's a population of people who want to do these jobs, when native-born Americans won't do the jobs, and there is no legal match for uh, the business to line up with the, uh, with the potential employee. Uh, it is beyond dispute that immigrants start successful businesses, and I was very pleased to learn that here in Jackson, uh, we're not only talking about sort of low-wage or close to minimum wage type businesses, but now uh, a lot of immigrants, and I'm almost certain that they have uh, legal status, but that they're employing uh, both people with legal status and people who are undocumented, um, and that they are becoming much more middle-class entrepreneurial type businesses, right? Uh, which is exactly what we should be encouraging uh, economically. And another reason for engaging in, this is the low-hanging fruit reform, right? Uh, limited immigration reform on lawful immigration is because we are competing with other companies, uh, other countries for global talent, particularly talent educated at our universities. So I'm not making this up. This is an article from August 7th of this past year in the Toronto Star, and Canada's immigration minister, Jason Kenney, basically decided that Canada is going to profit from American political dysfunction. Um, and this is in the newspaper, right? Um, so Minister Kenny has heartily endorsed his government's efforts to entice educated immigrants north of the 49th parallel uh, in order to uh, benefit from uh, American paralysis. Right? We're seeking very deliberately to benefit from the dysfunctional American immigration system. I make no bones about it. Um, so uh, there are now 350,000 living in Silicon Valley. And uh, they are setting up, uh, uh, there's Canadian flags on uh, 101 and uh, 280 in Silicon Valley. and. Um, there are lots of uh, immigration opportunities geared towards Stanford and Caltech graduates, uh, basically saying, we know you're not going to get a job in the US, so come to Canada, right? Um, uh, this seems to be as, uh, as straightforward uh, an example of poaching as you will ever see. <laughs> The third topic I want to talk about, again, we're talking in the category of lawful immigration, is the issue of refugee resettlement. Um, 49 states in this country participate in a program that is organized by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. The United States is a signatory to the Refugee Convention. By that, I mean that we have a legal obligation to uh, take convention-defined refugees, either uh, identified by our embassies overseas and then resettled here, and that's what we call a refugee, or people who come themselves using the self-help route, and we call them asylum seekers. And so we have uh, a legal framework that is supposed to help people who face a well-founded fear of persecution based on one of five categories, their race, religion, ethnicity, national origin, or membership in a social group. And uh, this is our post-Holocaust commitment to uh, 
uh, not repeating the shameful history of turning away Jewish refugees from Europe in uh, the late 1930s, and uh, it is now part of our international law and our domestic law. And uh, we participate in this UN High Commissioner for Refugee program where we resettle refugees from around the world. Um, there's an office in Washington, D.C., which farms out the admitted and screened refugees uh, who come into the country to usually faith-based groups or civil society organizations around the country, and uh, they resettle refugees in 49 states. Guess which one doesn't resettle refugees? It is Wyoming, and for reasons that I think are historically good and bad, right? So the good reason is that um, we don't have a critical mass of population in most of our communities. We don't have good bus service. We don't have uh, a lot of entry-level jobs that uh, people from war-torn places around the world can easily uh, step into. And so we haven't had a, uh, uh, a refugee resettlement program because um, it's harder to do that in uh, Gillette than it is to do in uh, Denver, right? Um, the bad reason is uh, outright xenophobia and racism. And how do I know this? Because uh, Governor Meade has invited me and others at the University of Wyoming to become part of a task force to examine whether we should become the 50th refugee resettlement state. Um, the finances are not in dispute. By that, the federal office and the UNHCR pay 100% of the costs of refugee resettlement for many years, right? So it's not like we're gonna get stuck with an unfunded mandate. And we have the capacity to set this program in motion. Um, but uh, when Governor Meade struck up this task force to examine the issue, he was barraged with emails from uh, some conservative groups accusing him of facilitating the uh, entry into Wyoming of uh, Ebola-carrying Sharia law advocates from uh, Central America. Um, um, in Wyoming, when you send five emails to the governor, he writes a personal response, um, which he did in the, uh, 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 in the Star Tribune. So um, at the moment, we are studying the issue. There is a uh, remarkable fellow in Gillette named Bertin Bahigi, who is a former child soldier from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, he, he was refugee resettled in Maryland. He then moved to Gillette. Um, he is a phenomenal oh. soccer player. Uh, he's the coach of the uh, uh, high school soccer team, and he's a math teacher at the high school in Gillette. Um, and I have been working with him and others to try to bring his family who are stuck in a refugee camp in uh, Uganda uh, to Wyoming. Um, the whole community in Gillette has embraced Bertin. Um, he is uh, a remarkable person and he is the driving force behind trying to make a refugee resettlement program that would, um, uh, that would apply to Wyoming. His big prize right now is that he may get his family out of Uganda, but they're likely to be resettled uh, 2,000 miles away. Um, and so uh, he'd like to bring them to Gillette and to use the sort of goodwill that he's built up to uh, create a model program for the state. Um, uh, I'll wrap up with two observations. Number one is that this week is the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And uh, when we said we could do better as a global community, I think we meant that we would take refugees um, from places of persecution. And one of those refugees uh, to the United States was Albert Einstein. Um, I've left some literature outside uh, uh, about our program. 
Uh, I would welcome any questions or comments you have about uh, uh, any of the aspects I've talked about, but specifically uh, if you're interested in participating in the refugee resettlement conversation, please see me at lunchtime or send me an email. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.